Hello there. Welcome to another Fireside Chat. Not to be confused with Planet America, our pithier Wednesday night show. I'm John Barron. Yes, this is the longer chat with deeper dives and special guests and, importantly, less pith. Much less pith. Oh, and I'm Chesla Chidala. Now, two great guests for you this week. Later on, I'm going to be talking to Mitt Romney's biographer, McKay Coppins, about his incredibly candid new book and Romney's visceral hatred of Donald Trump and pretty much everybody in the Republican Party. And as Congress continues to barely keep the government functioning, I'm going to be looking at what's driving increasing partisanship and polarisation with political scientist Lee Drummond. Here we go, data time, Very Johnny. wonky stuff. But first... Members of Congress are heading home for the Thanksgiving holiday after the House and Senate both passed bipartisan stopgap spending bills to avoid a government shutdown this weekend. Democratic Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer taking a bit of a victory lap yesterday while also acknowledging that Congress has a long to-do list still, including funding to support both Ukraine and Israel. And he had a message in particular for the Republican Majority House of Representatives too. When you look at the struggles the House is having passing their, their partisan appropriation bills, it shows clearly what I've been saying all along. Bipartisan is the only way to get things done. Again, no government shutdown, no cuts to vital programs, no poison pills. It's a great outcome for the American people. Yeah, not exactly popping the champagne corks. There's a bit of fatigue on Capitol Hill. Members will hardly have time to digest their turkey and pumpkin pies before another two deadlines are looming again. One in January, the second in February. Now, without a deal there, we'll again be looking at another potential government shutdown or another series of short-term stopgap spending bills. And that, of course, will then be happening, Chaz, right in the middle of the Republican presidential primary, which kicks off in mid-January, which is not typically associated as a time of sort of moderation and compromise. No, no, but I will say this, that the Speaker, Mike Johnson, mm. is, uh, he has said there won't be any more short-term spending bills. He said, mm. that's it. This was the last short-term spending bill, he says. Yep. So we'll see how that goes. There's 22 congressional days left. And it's not going to be easy, John, because the, the way this works is there's 12 appropriation bills that need to be passed. The Congress has already passed seven of them, so they need to pass five more, but these are the five hardest ones. Mm. The Senate's passed three already as well. They need to match them up, right? And the, the, both sides need to agree. The three that the Senate has passed look very different mm. to the ones that the House have passed, right? The House, they've passed lots of spending cuts, they've got lots of border security, lots of what Chuck Schumer would call poison pills. Mm. The, the ones the Senate has passed, they've got Ukraine funding, they've got a whole bunch of things that the House aren't going to like. Someone is going to have to blink here. Yeah. And this is the hard part. The easy part is not what they've been shutting down the Congress for or narrowly avoiding shutting down the Congress for. It's the bit that comes now. Mm, and mm. they've got 22 congressional days to sort that out. Yeah, and, uh, and a fairly ominous sign for Mike Johnson as well. It became increasingly apparent after that bipartisan deal was stitched together with more Democratic votes than Republican votes as it was. Fewer than 100 Republicans ultimately voted for that continuing resolution. But uh, just as everyone was a collective sigh of relief, oh, great, it's, it's all happening, we can go off laughing and singing into the night. Uh, he tried to get another spending bill through and, bum bum, it went down. So he was given a hall pass by those Conservative Freedom Caucus Republicans who ousted Kevin McCarthy just this once. Yeah. Just this once, and they're not going to do it again in January and February as well. It's even worse than you just said, actually, because... It wasn't just that they voted down the spending bill. They voted down two spending bills just before this deal they just did, mm. their, the whole pass you just described. That's fine. That happens sometimes. What this was, was voting down the, the opportunity to debate the bill. Mm. Now, that's something that never happened ever mm. before 2023. And Kevin McCarthy started seeing people constantly voting to not even debate bills. Yeah. And now that's happened it's for the first a, time. It's kind of a Mike house Johnson. filibuster is, yeah. is what it's becoming. It is, it is. And, that's the, and that just happened now, as mm. you said, for the first time with Mike Johnson. So now he's in the McCarthy zone. So yeah. there's no more messing around. Yeah, it's going, to be, it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out uh, and whether, in fact, you know, the, the other way to look at it, maybe the optimist would say, well, once you get into a presidential election year, because the Republicans know that typically... Uh, you take the blame if you shut down the government. It, mm. doesn't, it doesn't see congressional or your party approval go up at all. Mm. And even if they have purists in their party that are saying, we need deep spending cuts because, you know, the economy is tanking, the inflation's out of control, 
none of which is true, of course, anymore. It's hard to justify those spending cuts because, you know, as we've reported, the economy is looking a little bit better right now. Yeah. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see whether they potentially inflict damage on their own party in a presidential year where not only they are on the ballot, but, of course, the White House and the great possibility of them winning control of the Senate next year as well. Absolutely. That is definitely a factor. And, look, these are things that Mike Johnson is going to be using to argue with as well. Like, what he has demonstrated, at the very least, like, I think he's really, it's really, up, he's really up against it here, but... Mm. He has demonstrated, at the very least, a bit of pragmatism. I was saying before, I was hoping that he'd be pragmatic. I think he has proven that he is. Mm. What he just did with that last deal just now, it's not just exactly what Kevin McCarthy did. It's even actually more aggressive than what Kevin McCarthy did. He didn't even put the deal that he just made through the Rules Committee. Normally, you're supposed to put any bill through the Rules Committee and then it goes to the House. Mm. He skipped the Rules Committee because he knew he wouldn't have the numbers from Conservative Republicans. That meant they need to get two-thirds of the votes in order to pass the bill. When you skip the Rules Committee, that's what it requires, two-thirds of the votes. Mm. He knew he had the Democrat votes, and so he intentionally spited the Rules Committee knowing he had the votes in hand, which is very pragmatic, very aggressive, mm. but it also creates some of those headaches you just described at the end of the hall pass. Yeah. So this, he's, he might be making life tough for himself, but at least he's shown he's got the medal to, to make stuff happen at the very least. Yes, and that he is capable of being bipartisan yeah, for just a small amount of time that the ultra-partisans will allow him yeah. to be bipartisan, which brings us to... Our first interview this week, looking very much at these sort of underlying currents that are potentially affecting what we're seeing on these individual policy matters. Totally, because what we're seeing here is unprecedented, and people go, "Well, it's because there's, it's because the, the freaks are running the, the asylum," <laughs> but the uh, but it, that's, that's not necessarily the case. Our next guest, he's a political scientist, and he thinks that the kind of chaos we're seeing in Congress is a logical consequence of trends that have been bubbling along for ages. Uh, he recently published a series of, I say, really interesting graphs, John. Mm -hmm. I'll take your word for that. <laughs> you might disagree. Uh, they showcase how this has all evolved. And I'd like to show you guys some of those graphs right now. Okay. Firstly, we're currently seeing a record low number of competitive House districts, both because Democrats and Republicans are increasingly living in different areas, but also because politicians are rigging their district lines so they don't face any competition. This means that politicians don't need to worry about being re-elected anymore. It's easy to get re-elected for them. They'll have a job as long as their party wants them. Secondly, we're seeing the lowest number of split districts for over 100 years. A split district is one where people vote different parties for their presidential candidate and their members of Congress. Why does that matter? A split district means the performance of the individual matters more than their party does. So there being almost no split districts means that almost every district is not only safe, but it's also heavily partisan. There's no incentives to reach across the aisle or to get stuff done. Your voters at home just want you to be a partisan hack. Thirdly, as time goes on, Congresses are seeing smaller and smaller majorities. So those margins are getting closer to that centre line you see there, which is zero. Uh, for instance, our current Congress has only a five-seat majority. That way, chaos lies. So even though each district is very safe, very partisan, the number of Democratic and Republican districts are almost identical. This guarantees a constant, bitter, partisan battle that is also super close, which makes it even more bitter and more chaotic. Talking about partisanship, if we look at the median partisanship of each party in Congress, you can see that Democrats' median partisanship has veered a little bit away from the centre of late, but Republicans' median partisanship have swerved rapidly away from the centre in a much bigger way. So that might explain why Republicans seem to be currently battling with more extremists than Democrats are. But even more than that, if we look at the internal disagreement and dissension within each party, the Republicans have stayed pretty divided amongst themselves for about 100 years, but Democrats recently have become much less divided much more united, and that might explain why it's the Republicans who seem to be cracking up under pressure right now. Well, I could spend all show rabbiting on about this, but John won't let me. So why don't we talk to the guy who compiled all that data, Lee Drutman from the New America Foundation. Lee, thanks for coming on the Fireside Chat. My pleasure. Lee, we see all kinds of crazy behaviour in Congress and we go, well, 
there's a loon. But there's the problem not so much that there's lots of loons, but that the system is working currently in a way that benefits loons and potentially creates more loons. Yes, absolutely. The, the system is empowering those on the extremes, on the fringes, and it is driving out people who want to govern and attracting people who want to fight. And that's a real problem. So which of the trends out there do you think is the most corrosive? The trend that I find most corrosive is probably the nerdiest and hardest to explain, which is the collapse of dimensionality. Uh, but I'll, I'll take a stab at explaining it, which is basically if you think of politics as being a bunch of different issues, sometimes you have different coalitions on different issues, and that's healthy politics. But when it's the same issues on the same sides over and over and over again, you wind up with this incredibly divisive, destructive, doom loop politics. And that's what's happened in the US Congress. And you can see that in the extent to which uh, a kind of one dimensional mathematical model explains everything that happens in Congress. And that can only work if all the voting at all of Congress is on this single dimension, this single partisan dimension. Lee, I'm just going to put that dimensionality graph up right now. So can you please explain what you mean by one dimensionality? Does that mean there's only one kind of partisanship? I'm, I'm a little confused about the concept of dimensionality. Right. Everything is the same kind of partisanship. So if I know your position on one issue, I know your position on every issue. So what it means is that's the same conflict, the same conflict, the same conflict over and over and over again on every single issue. And that means that you don't have sh the shifting coalitions that you really need for uh, for a healthy political system uh, because you have people who, who when they're constantly in, in the same conflict, they start to really dislike each other. And that describes American politics more broadly, uh, that, that everything is one big extended conflict. And there's no opportunities for different people to be allies on some issues, which is would be really essential for building some political harmony uh, across other lines. Lee, your graphs show that Republicans are becoming more ideologically extreme than Democrats are, but they don't explain why that's happening. Why do you think that is? Right. So in this one dimensional model, uh, Republicans have moved further to the right. And Democrats have moved to the, the left. And you know, I, I think a lot of it has to do with the coalition uh, that Republicans represent and where they win elections, which is in rural, very conservative, exurban, small town America, whereas Democrats have a, a slightly broader coalition that goes from suburban America to to, to quite urban America. Uh, so I, I think there's uh, a, 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 that explains some of it. I think the the nature of the conflict uh, is such that Democrats are really the party that that believes in government, so they're willing to make more compromises. Whereas Republicans are the party that really doesn't believe in the federal government, so they make fewer compromises. So if everything we've talked about so far are trends, does that mean that the symptoms are going to get worse? I mean, they're already pretty bad, but yeah, I think I think things will continue to get worse until we make some major changes to how we do democracy here in the United States. So what's your prescription for how we solve these problems? Well, I, I'd like to break out of our rigid two-party system, which is really the U.S. is the most rigid two-party system in the world. I'd like to, to see us move towards more proportional multi-member districts uh, for, for the U.S. House. Uh, uh, I think that there's considerable evidence when you look at democracies around the world that democracies that have some modest proportionality in multi-partyism have more fluid coalitions and less of this binary zero-sum politics and I, I think the, the U.S. is uh, ready for, for that change because people really are dissatisfied with the lack of options. The number of Americans who say they want more than two parties is about 65 uh, percent. Americans don't want another Trump-Biden rematch 
uh, Americans are hungry for more choices, and I think I think I think we will we will get there. Uh, and things may have to get worse before they get better, but I think it's increasingly clear that our system is unsustainable. Lee, we're hearing a lot at the moment about this being a bad period for democracy and about how a lot of people are becoming authoritarian curious. Is that related to any of these trends or is that just a completely different issue? So, so there are certainly stresses on democracies around the world, but I think the, the US is falling faster in every democracy ranking than most others. So there's something, there's something generally in in the air, uh, but I think that the U.S. has a particularly bad case of it because we have such a, a weak immune system uh, to to this frustration that's going on. But you know, I think things are moving. You know, I, I think the pendulum is swinging back a little bit. I was encouraged by the recent election in Poland, in which a coalition of pro democracy parties ousted. Uh, the uh, authoritarian party in a somewhat surprising election. I think we're seeing many, many other democracies around the world being somewhat resilient. I mean, there, there's always challenges to democracy and there are always frustrations uh, with how things are going. But I think what's going on in the U.S. right now is is really distinct and, and at the, the far end of the uh, extreme responses to some challenges. Finally, we've spoken about a lot of concerning trends over the last few minutes, but are there any trends in American politics that we've missed that are also concerning you? We've had two decades now in which really between 20 and 30 percent of Americans say that they're satisfied with the way things are going in this country. And there's just this growing level of broad disaffection alongside alongside this hyperpartisan polarization, and that that is really just a, a very dangerous situation. You look at at other countries where something like this has happened, you you have tremendous backsliding. So it's not surprising we're having backsliding in the U.S. So I I am worried. I, I hope. We'll have another progressive era and we'll do some democracy renovation, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I vacillate between uh, long-term optimism and long-term pessimism, but I have a lot of short-term pessimism all the time. And that is why you're perfect for our show. Lee Drutman, thanks for popping in for a fireside chat. My pleasure. Now to the presidential campaign, and Republican hopeful Nikki Haley had a roller coaster week. She again, of course, took top marks from viewers of last week's candidate debate. Her rise in the polls continues. She's overtaking Ron DeSantis in some of the early state polls as Trump's main rival. She's also shifted into second place in a couple of national polls today. And then last weekend came the announcement from fellow South Carolinian Senator Tim Scott that he was dropping out of the presidential contest that probably gave her some hopes of scooping up some of his former supporters. But then came this. When I get into office, the first thing we have to do, social media accounts, social media companies, they have to show America their algorithms. Let us see why they're pushing what they're pushing. The second thing is every person on social media should be verified by their name. That's, first of all, it's a national security threat. When you do that, all of a sudden, people have to stand by what they say, and it gets rid of the Russian bots, the Iranian bots, and the Chinese bots. And then you're going to get some civility when people know their name is next to what they say. Accountability. And they know their pastor and their family member is going to see it. It's going to help our kids, and it's going to help our country. Okay, there was a okay, bit boom in there. <laughs> yeah. So, she wants to make all <laughs> social media users put their name to their words online. No more anonymous comments on X, Twitter, and the like. Well, that was pretty universally panned by free speech advocates, certainly on the right, a lot of libertarians took exception to it. Presidential rival Ron DeSantis, he tweeted, Haley's proposal to ban anonymous speech online, similar to what China recently did, is dangerous and unconstitutional. He continued, it will be dead on arrival in my administration. <laughs> yeah. And he noted, you know who were anonymous writers back in the day? Alexander Hamilton, John Jay and James Madison when they wrote the Federalist Papers. 
I have to agree with that. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you who else agrees with that. Vivek yeah. Ramaswamy, who wrote almost an identical tweet an hour and a half earlier. Typical Vivek <laughs> to agree with DeSantis an hour and a half before DeSantis even said it. Yeah, like it might be a coincidence. Yeah, it yeah. could be. Yeah. And highly debatable as well as to yeah. whether there are any James Madisons on Twitter yeah, at the moment. Not. But yeah. Haley tried to clarify or clean up those comments. She appeared yesterday on CNBC's Squawk Box to try and suggest that, oh, no, no, Americans will somehow be exempt. Russia, Iran and China, North Korea too, know that the cheapest form of warfare is to spread misinformation. Look at what happened with Israel. You want to know where all this pro-Hamas information is coming from? It is coming from foreign actors that are sowing chaos and division. I want freedom of speech for Americans. I don't want freedom of speech for Russia and Hamas. And that's what's happening right now. So the way you fix that is we need our social media companies to verify everybody so that we can get all of those. So you're not really back. saying that people can't tweet. Anon I mean, that, that, but, well, but that's think, bad enough because that, you, you see what it's doing to, to our kids and bullying and everything do else. Do I think life would be more civil if we were able to right. do that? Yes. Do, it's the same reason why right. I think doxing, like, you know, you should stand by what you say. But no, like, if you can have anonymous, I don't mind anonymous American people having free speech. Okay. What I don't right. like is anonymous Russians and China, Chinese how, and Iranians having free how speech. Would Okay, now, <laughs> that is totally incoherent. Okay, yeah. For a start, how are you possibly meant to keep Americans on this while revealing the identity of foreigners on the same social media engine? That doesn't yes. make any so sense. So an whatsoever. American would have to prove who they are, to prove their identity before they can then be allowed to be anonymous, <laughs> which in a world where, I guess, if there was no identity theft, for instance, where a Russian bot could steal a driver's licence or... I mean, yeah. it, like there, there, are, there are technical and logical inconsistencies in it, even before you start to address the whole you are shutting down free speech. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I should also say, what she said there is garbage about all, all the misinformation and and, and the, the pro Hamas stuff is coming from overseas. That's just not true. The biggest misinformer, as far as I can see, is a guy mm. called Jackson Hinkle, who has about a trillion followers on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Pretty much every bit of misinformation goes through him. He's American, OK? Mm -hmm. Right now, for, through TikTok, there are a bunch of Americans. It came from Americans who are putting forward Osama bin Laden's letter to America mm. and saying, oh, this, this sounds really interesting. And people are, going, people are tearing their hair out going, these idiots, what are they doing? Mm. They're Americans. That's yep. not coming from overseas. Mm. So forget that point. Let's talk about the general issue, though, of what she's saying. OK, so for me, there's a couple of things here. All right, you already said the legal thing. It's clearly illegal. The, the, the Supreme Court has held many times that anonymous speech is part of your free, a part of your, free, your, your First Amendment rights. Yeah, and it is, I mean, you know, James Madison, John Jay, Alexander Hamilton aside, it is seen as being, I mean, in a sense, your, your ability to speak anonymously is a little bit like your right to have a gun. Mm. And so this is uh, one of your last lines of defence against tyranny. Mm. And you take that away and Americans do get very, very upset, even though they might be offended by some of the... a lot of the anonymous rubbish that you do see on these websites. But that's the thing. Like, the, that, that news anchor saying, well, what about bullying? That's the reason why people want to be anonymous, so they don't get bullied. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're talking about being bullied or cancelled or whatever, that's a reason to be anonymous. Whistleblowing is a reason to be anonymous. Mm. If you're talking internationally, which is what she was trying to argue in that second clip, there are people who live in dictatorships yeah. who will go to jail if they're right. not anonymous. If you're talking about national In places security, like Russia and Iran, for yeah, sure. Totally, that's yeah. right. So, so this, from a security point of view, it makes no sense as well. Mm. From a civility point of view, it doesn't make sense. Has anyone been on Facebook recently where people mm. put their actual names a lot of the time? They say some noxious things. Mm. All because you're using your name doesn't mean you're being civil. I just don't think any of this makes sense. I yeah, so. and the fact that uh, in the week when... Her presidential campaign was suddenly looking like a certainly a serious alternative to Ron DeSantis, and potentially in some of these polls that we're seeing, she's now getting above 20% in New Hampshire, within about 22 points of Donald Trump. He's still in front, no doubt about that. 
but Nikki Haley is getting within striking distance in some of those early to vote states which could change everything and if you look at the head to head polls Nikki Haley is leading Joe Biden by double digits yeah. in general election matchups she's beating Biden by 10 11 12 points in a Marquette poll today whereas it's much closer between Biden and Trump much closer between DeSantis and and Biden Nikki Haley has this strong electability argument right now and then she comes up with something that is Who's this meant to impress? It's not really a, it's not really a religious conservative pitch. Is she, is she, is she really, you know, talking about? Well, you know, you you need to be able to say things that your church pastor would agree with. Is that meant to get her votes in Iowa right now? Because Tim Scott's dropped out, and now suddenly she thinks some Christian conservatives might be up for grabs. It's a weird, it's a weird fight to pick. I think that I, look, I, I'm not going to say that this is going to lose her support. I think that it will. I think the people who are like me probably weren't supporting her in the first place. Mm. The people who are in, in, in uh, all about civil liberties. Um, but I do think that um, I, I could see it appealing to people who don't understand how social media works. Mm. I could see it appealing to confused old people. Yep. Yeah. Like, so, I mean, I'm who not are a reasonable proportion of the Republican primary electorate. To it, be honest. It appealed to that dude with the tie she was talking to. Sure. So, like, so, so maybe. Mm. All I'm saying is I just think it's a bad policy. That's all yeah. I'm saying. Mm. Uh, having said that, to be fair to her, it's not mm. the worst policy... Really? ..that came from a Republican primary candidate this week. Oh, what would this be? Oh, uh, that honour, uh, that belongs to Vivek Ramaswamy. I could have guessed that. He suggested <laughs> that on day one of his administration, he will instantly fire 50% of the bureaucrats. And how will he choose who to fire, you might uh, ask? Uh, a skills audit, a uh, merit-based uh, culling process, something like that sort. Very close. If your social security number ends in an odd number, you're fired! <laughs> what could possibly go wrong with that policy, John? So we assume that Vivek's own social security number ends in an even number. I think that's the only thing we can be sure of. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah that's, that is pretty wacky, Chaz. Yeah. Pretty wacky. <laughs> also this week, Democratic Senator Joe Manchin has given his strongest indication yet that he is considering a presidential campaign of his own next year. The 76-year-old, of course, announced last week that he wouldn't be recontesting his West Virginia Senate seat. Earlier this week came news that a group pushing a unity ticket with Mitt Romney and Joe Manchin calling itself America Back on Track, had filed paperwork to form a formal draft committee with the Federal Election Commission. Well, that was news to Mitt Romney, whose office told reporters that he was not aware of a draft romney Mansion committee filing and not planning to appear on a third-party bid in 2024 either. Draft committees are sometimes formed by supporters and potential donors to try and test the waters, see if there's any interest in a campaign. They sometimes do push a candidate into ultimately running. If there's a lot of money and the polls look good, Joe Manchin may not need a lot of encouragement either. In an interview yesterday with NBC's Kristen Welker, Manchin said that he was absolutely considering a centrist presidential campaign next year because he said of the danger that Donald Trump poses to American democracy and, on the other hand, the way he thinks that Joe Biden has been drawn into left-wing positions. Take a look. I will do everything that I possibly can I'm totally, absolutely scared to death that Donald Trump would become president again. I think we will lose democracy as we need it, know it. And I'm afraid that Joe Biden's been pushed too far to the left. Can he come back? We'll see. But the bottom line is that's not the Joe Biden that we thought was being elected to go that far left. Just to clarify, just to put a fine <clears> point, I know you haven't made sure. any decisions, but are you considering running for president? I will do anything I can to help my country. Is that a yes? And you're saying, does that mean you would consider it? Absolutely, every American should consider if they're in a position to help save the country. I think we're on the wrong course. He seemed to be suggesting every American could, should consider running for president. I think every American is running for president. <laughs> yeah, getting close to that. I, point. I like the way he described himself as being in a position to save America. Talk yeah. yourself up, mate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's, uh, he's he certainly looks into the shaving mirror in the morning and sees a, a president looking back at him. Does Joe Manchin? What was interesting to me about that was though the way that Manchin was clearly suggesting that Joe Biden should be shifting to a more centrist yeah. position. And I guess what Manchin is doing is effectively applying pressure to counteract the possible effect of the left-wing candidates we've been talking about, like Cornell West, Jill Stein, to a lesser extent Robert Kennedy Jr., although he's sort of hard to pin on the political spectrum. But he's essentially saying, Joe Biden, if you don't shift to the centre, then I will run in the centre and make you compete for those votes, uh, which could get pretty disastrous for Joe Biden if he's losing the centre and the left, yeah. that doesn't leave too much in the middle for, for Joe Biden. No, it doesn't. Although I'm not sure Manchin should be uh, lecturing Joe Biden on electability because mm. uh, would you like to guess what his favourability rating is according to PRRI polling? 
There's mansions, favourability? Mansions, national so, favourability rating. So Biden and Trump are both around 39.40. Yep. So I'm going to say for Manchin, he's a very popular senator in West Virginia, mm. 35? 12. 12. 12 percent favourability. What, what did he do to upset everyone? Yeah, for, well, he's 41, to be fair, 41% yeah. unfavourable, lots yeah. of unknowns. Lots of unknowns, right. Yeah, okay, but still, 12. Yeah, right. <laughs> sure. And the, the key about that mm. is when he's talking about, you know, Biden needs to become a bit more conservative. Mm. The number, the percentage of Democrats he was favourable amongst is 7%. The percentage of Republicans he's favourable amongst is 18%. So yeah, maybe right. he's moved a little bit too much to the right. Mm. And the result of that is maybe, and I wouldn't have predicted this until I saw this poll. He takes votes off Trump. Maybe he takes votes off Trump. They PRRI actually actually threw that out there. Mm. They they polled, this is from October, right? He polled Biden, Trump by themselves. Biden led 48 to 46, two-point margin. Biden, Trump, Manchin and Cornell West. You'd think Cornell West would take votes from Biden, not, mm. not Trump. Mm. Biden is leading by three after that, so mm. more. Manchin took 10%, Cornell West took 5%. But Manchin took votes off Trump. Interesting. This is shaping up to be a very, very <laughs> complicated election year, no doubt about it. A new biography of Mitt Romney, meanwhile, reveals that the 2012 Republican presidential nominee did seriously consider running again next year as an independent presidential candidate, basically with the sole aim of trying to stop Donald Trump being re-elected. That's one of many fascinating insights contained in McKay Coppin's new book. It's called Romney, A Reckoning. Let's start with Mitt Romney on Mitt Romney. What did you make of his personality in this? His journals reveal he, almost a self-loathing at times where he refers to himself as stupid, stupid, stupid when he made that 47% gaffe in the 2012 presidential election against Obama. What did that tell you about him? Yeah, in public, Mitt Romney always kind of projected this air of the the kind of confident businessman, very buttoned down, uh, maybe a little stiff, maybe had a little bit of a tin ear, but, you know, was overall seemed like a, a very confident guy. In his journals, one of the more revelatory things to me was just how often he would beat himself up, you know, as a presidential candidate, he would routinely end the day by getting out his iPad and kind of venting into his journal about all the mistakes he had made that day, the gaffes that he had co committed, uh, you know, how, how he was going to let everybody down. Uh, there was one moment in, in the campaign when uh, he a, a, hot, a video came out showing him uh, demean the 47% of Americans who he, he said in this private fundraiser, you know, weren't willing to take responsibility of their own, for, over their own lives. And it was a big moment. And, and in the campaign, Romney tried to defend himself and say that it was being taken out of context. But in his journals, night after night, he would just kind of castigate himself for having said something so stupid. And, and I thought that was kind of an interesting window into to what he's like. And, and the fact that after that 47% gaffe uh, in the 2012 campaign, he offered, essentially, to drop out of the race in, with just weeks to go until the election. What did you make of that and what did that tell us about Mitt Romney as well? It, it almost seems like insecurity. Six weeks before the election. I mean, this is not something that, that typically happens, right? He called a chief, the chief strategist of his campaign and said, should I just drop out? Yes, I think that you could, you know, maybe... Uh, uncharitably say that he he was kind of weak-willed or, you know, insecure. But I, I think it's more that he just has an enormous fear of disappointing people. And this has come up again and again in his life and career. You know, as the nominee of a major party, uh, you, you really don't want to let down all the supporters, all the donors, all the people who have worked for your campaign. And he uh, he felt that responsibility very heavily. And what do you make, McKay, of the, of the similarities and differences between Mitt Romney and Donald Trump? In a sense, both of them, very wealthy men with very wealthy and powerful fathers, uh, but in, in temperament, of course, they, they couldn't seem to be more different. What do, what do you make of the pair of them and the way that they have interacted? Yes. Well, he actually has known Donald Trump for a long time. I write in the book about their, the first time they met was during this kind of surreal trip that Romney took to Mar-a-Lago in the 1990s um, with a group of business associates. And for a long time, Romney saw Trump as not a serious 
political figure, certainly, or even really a serious businessman. He, he thought of him as kind of a loudmouth celebrity, right? And he found him entertaining, and he he liked talking to him. He thought his, you know, he could be kind of gossipy and and funny and outrageous, um, but he never took him seriously. And in 2012, when Romney was running for president, he actually accepted Donald Trump's endorsement at a public event in Las Vegas, and. You know, now you look back on that moment and, and think, wow, that must have been really humiliating. Why, why did you do that? And I asked him about it several times. And what Romney basically said was, you know, Democrats and Republicans have a long history of accepting endorsements from dopey celebrities, right? Why can't I stand on a stage and take the endorsement of the, the celebrity apprentice host? Um, it wasn't really until 2016 when Trump himself was running for president that he started to see how dangerous Trump could be. Um, his, you know, both the outrageous things he would say about immigrants and refugees and various minority groups in America, but also the kind of illiberal tendencies he had. Trump's willingness to talk about throwing reporters in jail, his encouragement of political violence. You know, Romney started to see Trump as a much more malevolent force than he did for, for most of the time he had known him. Reading your book, McKay, it does seem that Mitt Romney spent an awful lot of time in 2015 and 2016 trying to find ways to stop Donald Trump becoming president in the first place, including putting his support behind somebody in Ted Cruz whom Romney actively loathed. What did you what did you think of that calculation? He, you know, this was a, an interesting thing I learned from from looking at his journals and emails. He he spent so much time in the 2016 primaries, really from March through May of 2016, trying to get the remaining Republican primary opponents of, to Donald Trump to work together. Basically, his argument was. Let's get all these campaigns to uh, to collude with each other, to you know divvy up the different states and and basically deprive Trump from winning the nomination. Um, what he found though was that even when he appealed to them on rational, self-interested basis, or if he appealed to them on kind of lofty patriotic terms, nobody wanted to really give up even a modicum of short-term political advantage. They were all. They, you know, they all still wanted to be the the guy, and they thought that if everybody else just got out of the way, they could beat Trump. And instead, what happened was that Trump continued to win primaries with the plurality of the vote, and eventually everybody else dropped out, and he won the nomination. And it drove Romney crazy just how disorganized and feckless his party's leaders were in the face of what Romney considered a real emergency, the, this rise of Donald Trump. And he continues to be frustrated by that. You also report in this book, McKay, that Mitt Romney actively considered running for president again in 2024, uh, basically to take down or try to take down Donald Trump. What did you learn there? Well, he, he really wanted to run as an independent. He doesn't feel like he has a political home in the Republican Party anymore. And he wanted to be this third party voice where he could get on the stage with Joe Biden and Donald Trump and and really make his case against Trump specifically. He, he actually doesn't mind Joe Biden. He disagrees with him, but he likes him as a as a, you know, as a president, as a person. But uh, he really wants to kind of prosecute Donald Trump on, on the debate stage or on the campaign trail. He ultimately decided against it because he was convinced by some of his political advisors that if he ran, he would inadvertently end up helping Trump. Uh, he thinks that the, vo the, the voters that he would peel away uh, would probably be Joe Biden voters and that he might inadvertently uh, create a situation where Trump gets reelected. And to Romney, that is the nightmare scenario. As much as he disagrees with Biden on policy, he thinks Trump in a second term would be extremely dangerous. And so he he's not willing to do anything that might bring that about. So do you think Mitt Romney has any role to play now in 2024, either as a candidate or as somebody who's uh, offering critiques from the sidelines? Or have is the sad fact most people have forgotten who Mitt Romney is. They don't really care anymore. They've stopped listening to him. I think he'll continue to be outspoken. He'll still be a U.S. senator for one more year. He's he's retiring uh, in January of 25. Um, and I wonder if he'll work behind the scenes to, see, to, to try to stop Trump. I mean, look, 
you know, he, he still has a big voice. He still can get on TV or, uh, you know, into the newspapers whenever he wants. Um, I don't know if he would go as far as endorsing Joe Biden. You know, that's a question that's been put to me. And, uh, I, you know, I, I don't want to rule anything out because I think Romney still thinks of Trump as a as an, an ongoing emergency. But he really doesn't have a lot of influence anymore in the Republican Party. He's kind of seen as a pariah. And so uh, we'll have to see what what role he has going forward. I, I'll, I'll say this. I'll add this. I think that if somebody could convince him, this is my opinion. But if he could be convinced that running a third party campaign for the presidency would hurt Trump, even if it wouldn't lead to Romney getting elected, if, it, if he believed it would hurt Trump, I think he would do it in a second because he would relish that opportunity to be on the stage. But he hasn't seen that evidence yet. Throughout the book, McKay, there are lots of very frank character assessments by Mitt Romney of other high profile political figures. Uh, some of the feuds are well known, others less so. What ones stood out to you that were particularly venomous or vitriolic or surprising? Well, you know, a lot of the comments he made about his fellow Republicans were in his private journals, which he gave to me, I later found out, with, without having reread them. So I, I think he was taken aback when he, he did ultimately read the book by just how much he had revealed to me. You know, he called Mike Huckabee the caricature of a for-profit preacher. He called Ted Cruz a demagogue and frightening. Um, he, But some of the comments were things that he said to me uh, in the course of our interviews. One that I thought was especially uh, withering was he was talking about J.D. Vance, who uh, was the author of a very popular book called Hillbilly Elegy. And Romney saw him as kind of a thoughtful, young, up-and-coming conservative voice who then took a hard right pivot into Trumpism when he decided to run for Senate in Ohio. And what Romney told me was that uh, it would be hard for me to disrespect someone more than J.D. Vance. <laughs> Um, which, you know, is about as, as withering as you can get talking about somebody who would ultimately become a, a colleague of his in the Senate. So having spent years covering Mitt Romney from the time when he was aspiring to the most powerful political office in America to now announcing his retirement from the Senate and a return to private life, uh, what do you think history will ultimately say about Mitt Romney? Will it be kind to him? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think history is a ruthless editor. And and when it comes to people like Mitt Romney, um, you might only be remembered for a couple lines in history, right? I think, though, that this last chapter of his career, where he stood up against what he considered the, the dangerous, toxic forces in his party, followed his conscience, even when it meant effectively the end of his political career, um, I think that that's what he'll be remembered for. I think even more than his presidential campaigns, even more than, you know, the the policies that he uh, helped implement in Massachusetts, I think he'll be remembered for this, this moment of following his conscience when everybody around him seemed to be uh, falling into the depths of cynicism and hypocrisy. I, I think that uh, I think that if he gets one line in the history books, that'll probably be his line. And, and what do you think Mitt Romney has made of his own career in recent years, including his time in the Senate and as a Trump critic? Is he still seeking redemption for that loss of the presidency in 2012? And if so, to an extent, does he feel as though he has achieved that? I think that he has been striving in these last several years to... Um, to help rewrite his legacy a little bit. And, um, you know, whether it's redemption for 2012 or just, you know, a, a, an opportunity to do fully what he believes is right after a career when that wasn't always the case because in politics it never is. Either way, I think that he will, uh, I, I think he does see this as kind of a, a, a an opportunity to, uh, to end on a high note. McKay Coppins, congratulations on Romney, a reckoning, and thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us about it today. Thank you, John. Oh, and looky that we're out of time once again. That's all we have for this Fireside Chat. Do join us for Planet America next Wednesday night. It is the 22nd of November, an important date, the 60th anniversary of the assassination of America's 35th president, John F. Kennedy. And you'll find both our Wednesday and Friday shows on ABC iView, Facebook and YouTube. And do not forget that pet podcast right there in all the usual pod places. Bye-bye.